Yeah. Hey, man. I don't know how that happened. I don't know how that happened. Can y'all hear me now? Can you hear me, coach? Why y'all can't hear me? Can y'all hear me now? Dang. Okay, that was weird. I guess it wasn't weird. We had a lot of photos earlier, but I don't know. Coach, coach, been hearing me. We've been vibing. Did y'all hear the vibe? Did y'all kick the vibe? Cool, man. Hey, it's dope. It's dope. The podcast don't really start until after I introduce him anyway. So, oh man, this is Coach Caldwell. So let me get going because I got a lot I want to talk to Coach Caldwell about. So. I always got to make these couple announcements. Uh, guys, thank you for supporting this channel. It is, you know, you guys are awesome. I love the feedback. I love it all. Please continue to share this page. Tell your buddies. You got time right now to share this live because it's going to be fire, okay? Keep hitting the like button, leaving comments. I actually try to read the comments. I try to respond. So thank you guys for all of that. I said this last time, my Facebook guys, you only get the live stream. There's so much more to the channel. It's football contents, play breakdowns, coverage explanations, film reviews, 
cool stories, pre-recorded player interviews I've started doing. All that stuff is on the YouTube channel, so make sure you go there and subscribe, okay? All right, guys, it's enough of that. Enough of that. You guys can hear me. We're good. We're alive, and we got Coach Caldwell in the building, okay? It's time to bring him out. I've, I've delayed long enough. I've given people enough time to get in. It's time to bring him out, man. He's, like I said, one of the most inspirational men. Incredible, incredible, incredible young. Oh, I can't even say that. But incredible man, coach, two-time Super Bowl champion, has worked with some of the greats. Guys, please put the clap emoji in the comments. I'm going to give a round of applause for Coach Jim Caldwell. Thank you. Coach Caldwell is in the building. How is it going? Going well. You know, I'm, uh, it's a real honor for me to have an opportunity to be on your show. I had uh, I'd heard quite a bit about it, actually, um, and uh, didn't realize how widespread it was. Uh, but obviously, you've been getting some great feedback. Uh, you've been doing a tremendous job, and you've had some some guests probably a lot of other folks couldn't get, and particularly Calvin. I saw <laughs> Calvin was on the show. I said, <laughs> you must have worked a little magic uh, hey. to get him on the show. Um, I, You know, I just talked to Calvin. I asked him, and, you know, Sometimes, sometimes you just got to ask people and be nice and make them feel appreciated, make them feel wanted, make them feel all those things that, you know, they probably don't feel a lot of times. And, you know, Kevin was open to it and, and it was fun. It was a good show. And so that's the thing about, about the guests. You know, I, I told you, I was telling you before the show, you know, I put in the, in the, um, in the rules that we don't discriminate. So I'm not afraid to just ask people. I mean, all they can say is, nah, man, I can't make it happen. I've had a couple of guys say that they can't make it happen. That's fine. I just ask somebody else, you know? So I'm glad that you took the time and I know the fans are excited. Got tons of clap emojis in the comments. They're, they're excited for you, coach. So first off, the last that, you know, people probably heard from you, you know, at least publicly, at least I know, was you taking a leave of absence, obviously, to focus on your health. So how are you feeling now? Like, how are you are you feeling better? Yeah, feeling great, actually. Um, almost uh, back to fighting weight, you know, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I feel good. You know, I, I had um, I had an issue that popped up that really was something that could be corrected without surgery. Um, and just a matter of getting a little bit more rest and watching my diet and, uh, you know, that kind of thing and exercise, which I've always done, as you well know, right. uh, I constantly exercise. But the interesting thing was um, I had to change my diet quite a bit. So I've been strictly a plant based diet for well over a year now. Uh, so I've lost since you've seen me, I've lost 32 pounds. Wow. Uh, so, yeah, so it's a, a, a little different body type than the one that you're used to seeing standing before you. But you know what? I feel great. I feel good. And uh, I'm running, I'm biking, I'm, you know, I'm doing some road uh, cycling and uh, doing, uh, you know, usually I did all the Peloton stuff, but now I get out on the road a little bit and, and uh, you know, running two, three miles and, uh, you know, really, really feeling, feeling good, doing a little lifting and that kind of thing. Really? And, and, and for guys who don't know, I used to be in the weight room super early most of the days when, when I had to lift and I could always look up on the top level and Coach Caldwell to be right up there getting his workout in on the bike. He'll be in there lifting, be walking around the field, doing all types of things to stay in shape. So that is that was dope to see you coaching there, hanging out, working out, doing all those cool things. So obviously, you know, it's the world is dealing with COVID. Um, what are, what are some of the things that you are doing to try to stay safe from from this COVID? And how, and how are you handling it? Yeah. yeah, you know, we've tried to uh, keep our family in somewhat of a, a bubble. Uh, my wife and I are down here in, in North Carolina, in Clemens, North Carolina, just outside of Winston-Salem. But our kids are in this area. Um, our oldest son and his two kids and wife live about 10 miles from us. Our two middle boys live in Raleigh, about an hour and 45. And my daughter lives... Uh, in Charlotte, Mint Hill area, actually about an hour and five minutes away. But we've been trying to make certain that we keep it all encapsulated. We don't do a whole, we haven't done anything publicly. Um, 
And, um, you know, for the most part, our socializing has just strictly been with my wife and I and a very, very small group of people. And I go out and play a little golf and that's about it. Uh, and it's wow. been that way for a matter of months, but I've been able to stay quite busy. Well, I mean, I, I'm sure, you know, I mean, you was telling me so many things that you've been doing and we're going to we're going to touch on some of those things. But hey, man, I know if Coach Caldwell can stay home, keep 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 safe, stay in the bubble. You guys can do it as well. You guys can do it as well because the COVID is real. I will tell you that. All right. So we're going to get into the interview. OK, we've got rid of the. The first couple of questions. We're going to get into the interview. And, I, and I've always said, and I say this before, every time I do an interview, I do these to inspire, to motivate, um, to educate, to help people. Um, so many people dealing with so many different things. So many people can relate to some of the stuff that we're talking about. And I tell them, if you can't relate, maybe you know somebody that can. Okay, so... That's kind of one of the things I always have to say as to why we do this. And, and you know, I, I always try to be open and honest with the guests. OK, so I was telling you, I always feel like who we are as adults stem from how we were raised. And I know, you know, it, it was different. But tell us a little bit about your family, mom, dad, and what it was like for you as a kid. Yeah, well, um, I grew up in a um, pretty small bedroom-sized community, um, Beloit, Wisconsin. It's in the southern part of the state. Matter of fact, there's a, a road in the southern part of the city called Sherlin Avenue. On the north side of the road, you're in Wisconsin. On the south side of that road, you're in Illinois. So we're right on the state line. Um, my mom and dad were working class people. Our city was full of working class people for the most part. My dad worked for General Motors for 35 years, and my mother um, climbed the ladder from a nurse's aide to an LPN, a licensed practical nurse, to study to be a registered nurse, and then she became supervisor of a nursing home. So, um, but, but yeah, we understood what hard work was all about. It's very few times that I've known my father not to have two jobs, so I, I, I had a chance to see what that looked like in, in, in real life of a guy really dedicated to, to making certain that he took care of his family. Um, but, but most importantly, I, I have an older sister, a year older, and a, and a younger brother. But most importantly, I think when you talk about our family dynamics, it's really how they taught us to live our lives. Um, they were very, very strict, fundamental Christians. Um, we grew up a little bit different than the than rest of our classmates. Like, for example, um, there was never any card playing in our house, no dice. We couldn't even play Monopoly because they had dice in it. My mom would have wow. any of that. Um, there was never any alcohol, no profanity used. My mother's 86, she'll be 87, or my dad, um, she turns 87 in November, he turns 87 in December. But my mom, I've never seen her in anything other than a dress about midway through her to her calf. Um, you know, it was just kind of part, no makeup. Uh, and but they, they lived a life that was uh, we lived a life that was a little bit different, maybe than some of our friends. Uh, some of the folks that went to church with us I obviously knew. But but the, the other folks that were just a little bit different. We spent as much time in church as we did on the athletic field. So but it was, a uh, you know, we, we learned to be different. Uh, and that's one of the things that I think has helped me throughout my career. There's nothing wrong with being a little bit different, but it also taught me a great deal of discipline. Wow. I mean, I grew up a lot like that. Parents, a lot like that, big in the church. And a thing that was for, for when I was growing up early, early in my life was the, the, the battle between church and sports, right? Sometimes it was like, Hey, you can't be playing sports because you're missing church and, and all that good stuff, right? What was youth sports like back then, though? Like, I mean, that was a, obviously some years before I was there. What was youth sports like for you? Well, I'll tell you the interesting thing about that, particularly with the church. So I was just one generation removed from the big battle where that you can't serve two masters, right? right. Uh, so my, I actually have a cousin. Um, his name is Lawrence Hoskins. He's a pastor now of a church. And um, he was a great baseball player, um, got drafted by the Cubs, uh, went down to Arizona, uh, but he was torn. His mother was in his ear quite a bit about, hey, you can't serve two masters and they play on Sundays. Uh, so you got to come back home. It just kind of it really tore his spirit up. And he got back on a bus and came back to Wisconsin. 
Uh, and I think he regrets that even to this day. So I think he's probably 75 or so now, wow. uh, but but still looks like a phenomenal athlete. He's about 6'3", and one of those guys that, that you know, long and, and could run and throw and the whole bit. But but in my generation, it, it got a little bit more lax. Uh, so they were allowing us to play sports. So uh, my mother and dad allowed me to go out and do the things that I want, loved doing. And uh, so that was kind of what it was all about. But you know, youth sports in a, um, a very small town, um, it's an interesting phenomenon because you get to know your coaches because they've grown up in the community. Right. Uh, coaches get to know the players. Uh, it's a very sort of an intimate relationship. Uh, and uh, and back in those days, you played everything. So I played baseball, football, track, basketball, you name it. I did a little bit of everything. Wow. And so for those of you guys who don't know this, Coach Caldwell played college ball at University of Iowa. Um Let's let's take a let's take a a look for you don't believe me as coach Caldwell <laughs> as coach Caldwell defensive back at the University of Iowa for four years defensive starter give us a little insight as to what type of player was coach Caldwell a smart guy ball hawk physical noise talker <laughs> Well, you know, football was a little bit different back in those days. Uh, uh, number one, you know, obviously the older we get, the, the better players we become when we look back. Uh, but but I'm, I'm certainly not going to, to fall into that trap. I, I was a decent player. Um, you know, I think the, the thing that probably would jump out to most people that were around me, I, I, I had leadership, I think, from the, the get go um, because of my parents. And so I was captain of every single team that I've ever been associated with, as well as at the University of Iowa. Um, I played corner my freshman year, started at corner, uh, but then I ended up learning all the other positions. I played safety, I played strong safety, I played both corners. Uh, one game, I played three of those positions. So, um, it, you know, it, it was one of those things where when you act about what kind of player I was, well, back in those days, if a team threw the ball 15 times, we called them a passing team. Uh, so there was a lot of running involved, right? So you had to come up and support the run. And when I first got in the league in the Big Ten, I mean, you're talking about Ohio State, you're talking about Michigan. Right. I mean, they had some, you know, big physical people. And I was 169 pounds on the corner. And so, you know, that was going to be one of the first things that you saw was a pulling guard come around the corner right. and try to attack the freshman corner, right? So you, you had to be able to stand your ground, you know? And, uh, you know, back in those days, I had to do some things that, uh, you know, in order to kind of clean up everything so if somebody else could make the play, uh, you know, after I had to take those big guards out or whatever it might be. But, but you know, I, I was the guy that, um, uh, you know, did what I had to do. Uh, they, they coached us a little bit differently in those right, days. Right, so. right, right, right. <laughs> it was a bit, it was a bit tougher. Uh, I, I think a lot of the coaches probably that coached me back in those days may not have been around today. They would have probably <laughs> ran them out of football. <laughs> so, speak, they were speaking good men. of that, speaking of that, you were a four-year starter, and then you you finished and decided to go into coaching. What mm -hmm. what led to that? Did you not? you know, feel like or want to take a shot at the next level? You knew from the get-go I was built and born to be a coach? Yeah, well, the interesting thing is I always knew I wanted to do something that had an impact on young people. You know, most of my family members are all pastors of churches and ministers, and they're always dealing with uplifting and encouraging people and then trying to challenge people to be as good as they could possibly be in their spiritual life and also in the way in which they live their lives, period. Um, so I knew I wanted to be involved with something like that. And, and I thought about teaching and I wanted to teach more so on the college level. Um, that was my goal and aim. And uh, so once I finished up, um, you know, I didn't get drafted. I was one of those guys I probably wasn't quite fast enough uh, for 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 the position. And so I ended up uh, saying, hey, you know, uh, let me go back to school. Well, one of the coaches came up to me and says, hey, you ever thought about being a graduate assistant? Uh, this was the guy, a defensive coordinator, Larry Coyer. And I said, no, nah, not really. He says, well, hey, you know the defense. He's coming. You can help me. We got work for you to do, those kinds of things. You can break down film. And he said, we pay for your school. And I said, okay, good. I said, I, I think I can handle that. Right. But here's the interesting thing that you you, you, you might – and I thought I'd do it for, you know, a couple of years and, and then move on. But, but here's the interesting thing. So I was there, and I, I was a GA for four months. But I got married in the spring um, of my senior year, so we were just finishing up. And, um, you know, they gave us a little bit of money, but it wasn't quite enough to make certain I could take care of my wife and et cetera. So um, my job entailed where my day was during the season was this. I would get up early in the morning, 
and I had classes early. So I had an eight o'clock class and a nine o'clock class. And then, um, and then on some days I just had one class, uh, but early in the morning. Then I go to the office at about 11 o'clock in the morning and I work to about 11 o'clock at night, uh, if not a little bit later. Wow. And then I run home or I bring my clothes with me and I change into a security guard uniform. I was a security guard for Wackenhut Security Company at a place called Scheller Globe there. And they had two factories that shut down. They didn't have a third shift. Uh -huh. So they had to have a security guard on duty that would walk through the buildings at night to make certain there was not a fire or something. And they had this old Daytex key system. You have to stick the key in and turn it so they make certain that you're doing your job. So you made your rounds. So I had to do it like four times a night. But then I also did all of the scheduling for everybody else during the week. So I, I asked him, I said, now, you know, I, I'm, I'm still in school and I'm also working as a GA. I said uh, the guy was a, my English professor owned the Wackenhut security job. Uh, and he was uh, the holder, the owner of the franchise. Uh, so I asked him, I said, if I finish my job, I said, can I get off, a, you know, an hour and a half early so I could get just a, a couple hours sleep or an hour sleep before I start my day? He said, yes, yeah. if you can get it done, get everything finished, everything in place, make your rounds. He says, yeah, you can go ahead. And so I would get a couple hours sleep and I'd do, do it again. I did it for four months. And then wow. here's the thing too, Gover, that, that a lot of guys <laughs> probably don't understand is this that I, I never required a whole lot of sleep, um, but um, I also didn't think I'd be doing that forever, right? Um, so after four months, one of the coaches on the staff recommended me for a job at Southern Illinois University. Mm -hmm. And I went for the interview just to have the experience. Uh, I was the least experienced guy they interviewed out of the six guys. And make a long story short, I ended up getting the job. And, and I said, well, I'll do this a couple of years to see how it goes. And I realized I had a real knack for it. And the rest is history. Right, and, and like you said, the rest is history. You go on after a couple other stops. 1993, Wake Forest gives you an opportunity to be a head coach. Not only a head coach, but the first African-American head coach in the ACC. How did that feel? Um, it was um, a lot of fun. Uh, and and really kind of the, it was 16 years from the time that I actually began to, um, my quest as an assistant coach uh, that I got that job. So the, one of the things that uh, a lot of guys talk about wanting to be head coaches and things of that nature. Well, I, I realized after I was at Southern Illinois about three months that I could be a head coach in Division One as well. Um, remember now at that time, it was 1978, there were no African-American head coaches in Division One at that time. You know, the guys I had to look to if I wanted to see a like um, a person that looked like me was Eddie Robinson, Jake Gaither, you know, Eddie Robinson at Grambling, Jake Gaither at Florida A&M, you know, uh, Archie Cooley, um, you know, Big John Merritt at Tennessee State. You know, some of those guys that I had to, to had a chance to look up to until 79 um, when, uh, you know, at Wichita State, uh, Coach Willie Jeffries got that first head coaching job in, in Division One. Um, so I really had, a, a, you know, in my mind that I was going to work extremely hard to get in position to get one of those jobs. So I, I wrote on a little piece of paper. I was always been a great note taker mm -hmm. and I've always been a guy that's kind of set goals as well. So I put this thing down on paper, you know, what I want it to look like. When I said, when I leave this job, what do I want them to say about me? Uh, and I put the hardest working guy on the staff. All right. Knew his craft to the nth degree. Uh, motivated, right? Passionate about his craft, so on and so forth. I, I wrote those things down. And um, in every job that I had, that's the thing that I wanted to make certain that I knew what I was doing. And then I also had stepping stones. So I said, hey, first year, I'm going to learn my position. Second year, I learned every position on the defensive side of the ball. The third year, I want to be the coordinator. And that's exactly what happened. At 24 years of age, I was probably one of the youngest coordinators in all of Division One, And perhaps I may have been the only African-American. Uh, you know, back in those days, they didn't keep those kind of stats, those things. But I think if you look back, you probably see that I'm one of the very few. So once I had mastered that side of the ball, I had seen a number of guys that have had interviews that were African-Americans across the country, and they were getting denied. Hey, you know what, if he was a defensive coach, they'd say, well, you know what, you don't have any offensive background. If he was an offensive coach, hey, you don't have any defensive background. So I said, let me correct that problem and make certain that they can't say that to me when my time comes. So my quest then was to get on the offensive side of the ball. So every job that I took at Northwestern, I went and worked for Dennis Green. Uh, I told Dennis, I said, hey, I'll come and coach your secondary. I said, if, I said, if you will give me the first job that opens up on offense. I said, I don't care which one position it is. I said, if it's tight ends, receivers, I don't care. 
I, I want to go over on offense. And he said, hey, I'll do that. But I was there one year. Then I went to Colorado. I told Bill McCartney the same thing. I was coaching his outside linebackers there. Um, and then it happened. Um, Ron Taylor took a job at, I think, at Quincy College and opened up. And then uh, one of our other guys took another job out back in Washington. Uh, so it opened up the quarterbacks and receiver position. Uh, he gave them to me. So I got to that side of the ball. And then it was my quest to become some kind of coordinator at that spot. But then I realized real quickly that the offense runs with, through you as a, a quarterback coach. Right. Uh, so I felt like I had a, a real good handle on things. So um, it, it, it really set me up, I think, for the future, which was, which was certainly, uh, certainly good for me. Right. And you talk about the future. Coach Tony Dungy hired you in Tampa in 2001 as quarterbacks coach, right? A lot of great stories I've heard, but just talk to me about how you met Coach Dungy or like how did that whole thing come, come into play? Um, you know, first of all, um, he and I played against one another in college. He was a quarterback at the University of Minnesota when I was a defensive back at Iowa. So same conference. So we we battled one another four straight years. We're exactly the same class. Um, he started as a freshman at Minnesota as well. So we knew each other from the competition days. And then um, what happened, which is interesting, um, both of us at work for Dennis Green at one point in time. Tony worked for him in Minnesota. I worked for him at Northwestern, but also Denny coached at Iowa when I was playing there. Um, so we had sort of a mutual um, uh, connection there. But uh, I got fired at Wake and um, Super Bowl was held in Tampa and the Giants were playing uh, the Ravens that particular year, I believe it was. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they were having this big Super Bowl party down in Tampa and Tony went to the party. And so a lot of owners and players are there and Kerry Collins was kind of walking around and he and Tony strike up a conversation. And Kerry says to Tony, he says, hey, he says, coach, he said, I, I don't know, you know what's going on in the league. He says, but if there's anybody in the league that's looking for a quarterback coach, so there's a guy that just got fired at Wake Forest that, that guys in this league got to look at. Uh -huh. uh, and so that sort of caught Tony's ear. Well, I had called Tony a week before that uh, trying to get one of my assistants, um, Jamie Barisi, a position on his staff in the quality control position. So I had left him a message. Uh, he called me back. And I remember when he called me, I was actually at the um, uh, AFCA convention down in Atlanta. And I was in my room writing my final notes. I was the president of the ethics committee uh, in college. So I was writing my final notes and he calls me and we talk about Jamie. And then he says to me, he says, hey, what are you going to do? I said, well, coach, I said, what I think I'm going to do is I, you know, I still have three years left on my contract. I'm going to just uh, take a year off. I'm going to go around the country, see if I can learn some new things, get myself in position to be a head coach in college again. He said, well, have you ever thought about professional football? And I said, yeah, really? No. Nah. I said, I really have it. I said, coach, I said, you know, I, I never wanted to move my kids around that much. Uh, I like the college atmosphere. I, I feel that, that coaching college men, it, it's a calling because I can I can have an impact on them mentally, physically, spiritually, uh, you know, the whole gamut. They're, they're, right, they're right. searching for their identity and I can help grow and develop those guys. So I always felt like that was my ministry. Right. And he says, well, he says, think about it. He said, I, I might have something here for you. I said, well, coach, I said, first of all, I said, I hope it's not anything that you have uh, considering Jamie Breesey for. I said, because I don't want to compete with anybody on my staff. He says, no, 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 it's totally different. He says, it's a different spot altogether. He said, just tell me this. He said, would you be willing to talk to me if it happens? And I said, yes. So a couple of weeks later, it did happen. Clyde Christensen ended up moving to uh, the coordinator. There was a quarterback job open. I went down for the interview. I got the job. So that's kind of how that all materialized. Long story, but nevertheless, I think uh, uh, you get the gist of it. <laughs> hey, it all it all leads and it all just kind of happens and, and you got to be ready. And obviously you were ready, but I liked how you were just a noble man. Like, hey, even though it's a great opportunity for me, I don't want to compete with somebody that's on my staff. Somebody's trying to get the job. I'll, I'll wait. Like that goes a long ways because obviously, you know, some people don't care, man. They, they just trying to get it you know, how they can get it. But you go to, you go to, uh, Tampa, you and Tony Dungy, you follow him to Indy, you know, you guys go on winter Super Bowl. Um, great, great, great time. You work with Peyton Manning as a quarterback's coach. 
Tell us a good Peyton Manning story, like a good young Peyton Manning story. <laughs> um, uh, let me just tell you, here's here's one. This is kind of my introduction uh, to professional football um, after my second year. First year, I had Brad Johnson. I had uh, Joe Hamilton. I had Sean King, you know, three good men uh, that I worked with down, down in Tampa. And, uh, and then also I had Ryan Leaf, actually, uh, in there for a, a short period of time. Uh, and then we move on to Indy. And I uh, had an opportunity to obviously coach one of the, the, the best of all time. But, it, but here's a, a, a Peyton story for you, which gave you me a pretty good indication of who I was dealing with. Like I already knew. I mean, you hear the reports and you hear about, you know, how, how smart he is and how hard he works and all those kinds of things. And typically, you know, when you hear a lot of those things and, and you get there, you find out that, hey, you know, maybe they, they fall a little short in terms of those descriptions but he exceeded it by, you know, a hundred percent. So our first meeting, uh, it, it, we're sitting down and we're actually gonna go through cut-ups and it was he and I, Tom Moore, the offensive coordinator and Tony, Tony sat in as well. So I had taken, he had thrown, I think about 43 interceptions up to that particular point in those five years or something prior to our getting there. And so I went through the tape and I cut it up and, you know, I didn't know the offense at that time because it was early. I'd only been there a couple of weeks. Um, and so there was a lot of things that were kind of missing from the cutups in terms of description of plays and all that, but it had where the interception was thrown and all those kinds of things, right? So it was 43 of them listed. So we're going to kind of go through, and the exercise was to see if we could avoid any of these, you know, and if we could make another choice, if, if it could be avoided, and try to get some mutual understanding and a good feel for one another. So I have the sheet there, and it's got the 43 listed. Tony has a copy. Tom has a copy. I have a copy. Peyton has a copy. He walks in the room, and he looks at it, and he says, oh, he looks, it didn't have any plays on there, now, mind you. And he looks at it, he sees what game, he says, all right. He says, okay, now that play was, you know, dice right, 64 X and Z post, you know, but whatever it was, right? Whatever the play was. And he said, now, hey, on that particular play, I got double dipped. Tom, you remember that? He went out, he faked, he wasn't supposed to go inside. He, he came, you know, he double dipped me and, and I ended up throwing it. So he was right down all 43 of them. And there were three that he said, ah, you know what, I don't, quite remember this, but I think it's this. And he did that on those three. And lo and behold, every single one off the top of his head, just through memory, he told you every single, and those three that he said, I'm not certain, he was absolutely right. So that kind of gave me an idea who I was dealing with. Um, a guy that had a um, unbelievable memory, whether it was written or spoken, he would never forget a word you said or any play concept or anything that was certainly uh, uh, a said, uh, you know, a, a, about anything. And uh, and if you did, said it a little bit differently, he'd call you out on it in a minute, right? So uh, he kept you on your toes, but, but he was a great guy to coach because he loved to be coached and he loved fundamentals. Uh, and, and I think, um, you know, oftentimes nowadays, guys just want to get out there and throw the ball, but he right. worked at his fundamentals man, every single day. That's why he was so good. Wow, man, it's it's so great to hear inside stories from some of the greats, right? Some of the things that people don't know, um, but you know, and, and it's so cool that you would share something like that with us because obviously there's a reason why those guys are great. A lot of people, like I said, you think they just show up and they just play and they're just great. No, these guys are special individuals. And it translates on the field, memory, work ethic, all those good things. That's some of the things that you've been touching on, just work ethic and working hard and discipline and dedication. And you see it with our great players. And you go on, Coach, Coach Dungy, um, you know, leaves and you become now a head coach in the NFL for the first time in Indy. And you guys go back to another Super Bowl. How did it feel going from a quarterback's coach to now the head coach? Um, you know, first of all, um, after I was at Tampa for three months, I quickly realized that because a number of guys that left that staff, Lovey had gone and become a head coach, I think. And then also uh, Herm Edwards had left and become a head coach as well. And uh, it didn't take me long to realize that, you know what, I, I could be a head coach in this league as well. And, and just hoping that they didn't consider me too old because, you know, I had spent uh, 24 years in college. 
Uh, so I began to kind of study and get myself ready for it. But here's the thing that really, so I worked at it, worked extremely hard for those seven years I was working for Tony. I, I observed everything he was doing. I started to make my own notebook in terms of how I would construct, uh, construct practice, you know, just in terms of everything I would evaluate after every single day, I write little notes on our practice schedule and say, you know what, you know, if I had a chance to do this, I, I'd change this a little bit here or there. It wasn't very many things like that, but I wanted to add my own insight. So I had my own book all together in terms of staff responsibilities, the whole bit. So when I started to interview, first of all, before I got the job, I interviewed for several jobs in the National Football League, interviewed Minnesota Vikings, Buffalo Bills, um, uh, I interviewed at Dallas. Um, so there was a, a number of places, that I, uh, Atlanta, uh, and then also Arizona. Uh, and so I, I, I had my, my constructed my package and put it together. I was going for a second interview actually in Atlanta when they offered me a position as a coach in waiting at Indy. But here's the thing that got me ready for that job when you said the difference of position was what Tony Dungy did for me. Um, he allowed me, you know, oftentimes they give you that, that tag of associate head coach or assistant head coach or whatever it might be. This is what he did that. He told me, he says, listen, he said, you can sit in on every single meeting that I'm involved in. He said, if I got a player in there, just me and the player, you can come in, listen to how I handle it. Listen to see, you know, what you would do in those particular situations, put yourself in those situations. Right? So I did everything that a head coach would do for an entire year. I was in every draft meeting. I was, I broke down film. I looked at every single draft prospect that year. I mean, I did it all just like I was a head coach. And then he also allowed me to do some of the scheduling. He said, hey, take a look at this, make the adjustments where you think you need and, and, and give it back to me. I'll look at it and wow. see if we need to make some adjustments. So after I was finished, I mean, I had a real good sense of everything that was required of me from a, a you know from a head in terms of a head coach except for obviously the media responsibilities and i had already been through that uh when i was at uh obviously as a head coach when i was in college um so uh so when i took over that's why we were you know able to things were pretty smooth we had a really good team now don't don't get me wrong i mean we, right, we had right, some talent right. on that team right so right. um but but nevertheless uh you know it was um you know it, it was a lot of fun and he sort of laid the groundwork for me I'm really appreciative of that. Wow, man, that's great, man. It's it's great for him to do that for you. We all need that experience. And that goes into one of the things that I talk about in the DB room. He he couldn't have done that if he had any hate in his heart of another African-American man trying to move up in the coaching ranks. He was given, hey, I want to help you be a great coach as well. So shout out to Coach Tony Dungy. We got to try to get Coach Dungy on the show. He's a DB too. We gotta, try to, we gotta try to get Coach Dungeon oh, yeah. here. But you go on, you have your tenure in 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 Indy as a head coach, and you know what? We'll talk about that. The the, the ending was it's it's crazy, right? Peyton Manning goes down, don't have a great year in Indy, and then you get fired, right? You go to uh, Baltimore. Y'all go and win another Super Bowl, quarterbacks coach with Joe Flacco. And then for the meat and potatoes, probably what 80% of the people watching are waiting for. January 2014, January 14th, 2014, the Detroit Lions announced Jim Caldwell as their head coach. And not only that, we said this earlier about Wake Forest, you were the first African American to hold that position for the Detroit Lions. So I'm gonna give you a round of applause for that. But that's when I got a chance to meet you. That's when I got a chance to meet you and I got a chance to play for you. And that was a beautiful thing. All right. So I want to hit a little bit on a couple of things. All right. So did you really feel that you could change that franchise around. Cause you remember back in 2013, you know, I mean, they were having off the field issues, on the field issues, you know, just different things in the city. I, I told, I've told them and said this numerous times from a national perspective, you know, Detroit didn't look so appealing just from what you see and what was, you know, shown shown on tv and and the perception and all that stuff did you really feel like you can come in and change that organization around 
And like, what was your mindset going into that situation? Yeah, you know what? Uh, ironically, I really did. Um, and, and, I, and I felt that way from the onset. As soon as that uh, job came open, I, I felt out of the jobs that were available. I interviewed at Washington, I think that year. Um, I was considering obviously even possibly going back to Penn State because, uh, 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 you know, that job had opened up as well. O'Brien had left there. Um, and uh, but I looked earnestly um, at these opportunities and the one that I felt that that fit, sit well, really sat well with me um, was the Detroit job, because, number one, uh, it's, it's a similar sort of makeup in terms of the city. Um, I'm from an area where there's a, a Chrysler plant to the south of, of Beloit, uh, and then there's General Motors to the north. A lot of the folks within my, my, my our city, um, obviously my father, as I mentioned before, but also my relatives worked in the automotive industry. I'm a UAW kid, uh, so I, I felt there was a huge connection between me and the city of Detroit, right? Uh, and uh, and I just felt it was one of those things. I had an opportunity. As a matter of fact, the year before, I was at Baltimore, uh, and we played against uh, against Detroit. And and I said, man, you know what? That would be a really good job. Uh, and and I, I just thought every once in a while, you know, you just get that sense that it's the right place for you. And I certainly felt that way. But let, let me also just throw this out at you too. I don't think I was the first choice. I, I really don't. And I, and I think that oftentimes happens, but but I think it ended up being the right one for me because I think I think probably Ken Wizard, I believe, turned that job down. Right. Uh, they may have offered it to him. It's kind of what I understand, but uh, but but nevertheless, uh, it, it worked well for me. But he was thinking probably the same way. You'd have to ask him. To, you know, don't take this as a gospel. Uh, but I, from what I heard, that he thought it was easier to get to the playoffs from Tennessee than it would have been from Detroit because Green Bay, Minnesota, you know, were, were really tough to, to overcome. They had really good quarterbacks playing in that league as well. And I just felt, you know, Matthew uh, looking at the defense, looking at the special teams units. I said, you know what, this is a really good team. Uh, and so we came in and, you know, like all, oftentimes guys come in and take over programs and they immediately want to get rid of everybody. Right. right they want right. to immediately go wash their hands and say, let me get my guys in here. When I come into a program, you know what I say? These are my guys. These are okay? my guys. These are these, these are, are my, my guys, guys. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And we're going to win with these guys, you know. And so, uh, you know, that's the kind of attitude that we took. And I think that's one of the reasons why we went 11 and 5, because we did have good talent there. Martin Mayhew. Uh, and those guys did a tremendous job of bringing in talent and had a really good nucleus there. I mean, that first year, I think our defense, you, you weren't going to run the ball on us. Uh, you no, know, Sue no. was up front fairly yeah, when he was in there. Was that, you know, yeah, you know, a real, yeah, had a real stout front linebackers that could run and hit Tully was my man, you know, yeah. out there playing the game like he knows how to play it. You know, I mean, it, 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 was, it was a great group of guys uh, t uh, to hear uh, Whitehead. I mean, it was it was a tough game. And in the secondary, I mean, with, you know, you back there leading the way, Rasheen Mathis on the corner, veteran yeah. guy. Uh, you know, how could you not look at that? Special teams were, were pretty strong. Uh, you had some really good guys out there that could do it. Don Carey, you know, it, it was a, a, as good as they come, it, as well as several other guys. I mean, I can mention a bunch of names, but we we, we had a real good nucleus. So, so we came in and just thought we could get this thing going and win games, you know, as opposed to saying, you know what, let me get rid of all these guys and and, and let's 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 do everything we did in Indianapolis and these guys aren't quite good enough. No, that's not the way it should be. You should be going there and try to win right away. And 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 I would say just from a player that was in that locker room, we could feel that. We could feel, at least I know I could, and a lot of players that I talked to, we could feel that you guys came in and believed in us right away. Like treated us like you have been knowing us the whole time. You you really came in, and I, I would say that from the whole staff that you put together, and, and I want to talk a little bit about that approach. You know, you, you, you see so many times that coaches, I don't want to say handicapped, but they I feel like they hurt teams by treating them like kids, right? One person get in trouble, then the whole team gets in trouble, and we can't do stuff because one person – got in trouble and I thought the approach that you had as far as treating us like men right treating us like men treating us with respect earning that respect on the field from, for how we played but also the consistent approach like I felt like that meant a lot to us as players so 
Like, where did you get that from to say, you know what, I'm going to treat guys like men. If you can't be accountable, then, hey, we'll find somebody that can. But I'm not going to punish the whole team because we had one bad apple. We're going to treat everybody like men. We're going to hold everybody accountable. And the law is, is just the law, right? Where did you get that approach from? Well, you know, I think it's, it's, it's really an approach that I saw every place that I went. Um, early on, when I took jobs in college, I took those jobs uh, primarily because they were going into a brand new setting. Uh, they were going in, their team had been losing, and I wanted to find out what that was all about, what they did, how they decided to turn it around. So when we first went to Northwestern with Dennis Green, uh, you know, I saw one, one approach. Uh, we played a lot of freshmen. We, we got battered around a bit. You know, I was there one year. I went to Colorado. They had been losing, Bill McCartney. But then we started redshirting freshmen and kind of bringing the program around, teaching them the fundamentals and basics. But yet still, I could sense right then and there, Bill always talked about it, as well as Denny, you know, you know what, hey, you guys are my men, okay? So we're going to get this thing done together. Now, not all of you are going to be here the entire time. You know, that, that's just the way it is. But nevertheless, you know, that core guys that are here that believe in what we're doing, hey, we're going to get this train moving in the right direction. And I saw that happen at every stop that I made. And I said, you know what? When I take over a program, when I got an opportunity that, uh, you know, that's the way that I'm going to do it. Because I believe in that, first of all. Uh, for, the other thing is, Glover, I don't believe in getting rid of good players, you know, right. I see that happen all over the league. I mean, it's crazy. I see guys run guys out of the building that are excellent football players. I'm not just talking about Detroit. OK, I'm talking about, uh, you know, all around the league. I can right, I can name right. some places right. where, you know, I, I don't understand that. Uh, it takes you four or five years to find another player like that. Right. right. And you're going to run that guy out of the building. Find a way to work with that guy. Now, if it was just somebody who's just absolutely you can't deal with because he's doing so many things that are, you know, that don't make sense that he's tough to handle, um, that he's, uh, you know, arrogant, that he uh, can't be coached, um, that's different. Uh, but for guys that are manageable and they can play, you know, uh, it, it, it makes no sense to me. No. <laughs> that's counterproductive. If I was the, if I was a GM or, or the owner of the team, I'd fire them, okay? <laughs> uh, you know, get rid of good players. I mean, that's just ridiculous, right? Wow. I mean, it's too hard to find good players. It, it is, and you did that. I mean, you... You came, like I said, you came in and you believed, you believed in us, but you also believed in your coaches, right? Your style that you don't see a lot from head coaches. I took it. You was more of a supervisor. Hey, this is my offensive coordinator. I want to empower him to lead the offense. This is my defensive coordinator. I trust these guys to run the defense. I'm the supervisor. I'm going to make sure that. The practices are going like they need to be. The guys are working. I'm going to manage the guys and handle my team. You guys make sure that you're putting in the right stuff, doing all those good things, right? So people be wanting to know, and they want to, you know, just get into the mind of, like, head coaches and things that go on. So they want to know, like, what goes into making a play call at that point, right? Is it more what you think? think the other team is going to do or more of what you feel like your players are good at a combination of both is it you know a, a coordinator make a call head coach like just tell us how does that work in, in the heat of, of of a moment yeah so um first of all um I've been an offensive coordinator and I've been a defensive coordinator. Uh, so I've been in both positions. And the worst thing that could happen is if they get caught up waiting for the head coach to give his uh, add his two cents in on a particular play. Or I've been in a situation where I've called a play as an offensive coordinator and the head coach said, ah, I, I, I don't want that. I mean, we got like two seconds left before, you know, you know, the clock goes off and and uh, and he wants me to change the play. So I've been in the middle of those kinds of things. So uh, so my goal and aim was to make certain that we function the right way. If I hire the right guys, all I have to do is manage them. OK, I have to make certain that I know what's going on in their meeting rooms, know what they're teaching, have a good understanding of what we're doing on game day, be able to step in, obviously, in some crucial situations. But uh, but uh, but I, I got to know our guys really well. Terrell Austin. 
Um, I, he worked for me at Wake Forest. Uh, he and I worked together at Baltimore. Uh, he and I worked together at Penn State. So I've known him a long, long time. When he took over that defense, I was real comfortable with him. Uh, and then also the same thing, Joe Lombardi, I didn't know that well, but you know, soon after we got Jim Bob in place and I knew Jim Bob well, because I brought him into Indy when I first came there. I knew, you know, what he was all about and, and how he functioned and, um, you know, those kinds of things we managed. Uh, and, and, but yet, uh, if there was a, t- a situation where I thought, hey, I needed to step in and take control, we did so, right? Um, but, but for the most part, you let them do their job. Uh, you hired them for a purpose, for a reason, uh, and you let them do it. Uh, and you don't want to undercut them. Uh, which I see happen all too often, um, mm-hmm. and uh, and you have chaos. Uh, so I wanted to empower our guys. And, and, and I will say, I've been on different teams. I've been on teams where you know it's not that way, and the approach that you took is was phenomenal. Wade, Wade Phillips was a coordinator like that. So you, Gary Kubiak, hands down, great, great, great in that. Um, aspect and wade phillips was the same way we would have defensive meetings with wade phillips there'll be three minutes wade's like hey this is what we're doing at practice uh let's have good effort and boom coaches go and coach your guys you know so i really really feel like that is a is a great approach right but we had some good years there you know we made playoffs two out of four years i felt like got the uh had the team going in the right direction right we were had two NFC North want to take all games week 17. Um, you know, we were having four or five national TV games a year. Um, like I said, kind of just got the organization going in a, in a respectable direction, right? Guys were talking a lot about it. The swag was there. Um, the respect was, was growing, right? And then the decision comes and it rips out the heart of a lot of fans, um, a lot of players, tons of players, um, including mine. I, I would say my heart was torn completely um, because we've had guys reaching out to me all week from Tully to Sheen to Slay, like so many guys that you work with. And I mean, even Muhammad Cisse reached out. I'm just like, man, the guy that forever will be indebted because he gave me an opportunity so many guys that you made impact on in their lives and the position comes out and Bob Quinn makes a move. Um, I've already put my feelings out about, you know what? I felt like it wasn't the right move, but I want to know what was your feelings in that moment? You know, feeling like we, we were going in the right direction and then to have that taken away. Yeah, certainly. Um, you know, I felt we were were certainly playing hard, tough, competitive each and every week that our team was growing and developing. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm appreciative of the Ford family giving me an opportunity. First of all, Mrs. Ford was, was great to me. Um, Bill and the rest of the group, uh, they were outstanding. So I, I really enjoyed that. But, but, you know, Bob came in and I think without question that had he been left his own devices, I probably would have been gone the day he came in. Uh, just kind of the feeling that I got, even though obviously it went through a two week process of kind of going through um, an interview process with him uh, in order to keep my job. Um, And I was thankful to be able to continue uh, because I did think that we were moving in the right direction. I did think that we had something going that was pretty special. Uh, And, um, you know, it's not easy to win. Uh, And and I think that oftentimes people kind of uh, take that for for granted. But um, but nevertheless, it's their choice to make in that regard. And, um, uh, and and I wish them well, but I think he wanted to get his own guy in there. He wanted to get someone that spoke the same language that he speaks. Uh, he wanted someone that he was comfortable with, and uh, and that's what he, what he what he got. Uh, and and obviously, uh, I think that's the way things go. You know, coaching. I've been fired a few times in my life, you know, uh, but I'm thankful for those opportunities. And uh, and usually, you know, usually the Lord has uh, another plan for me anyway. So uh, so I think it'll work out well. Wow, man. So. I will say that was that was a tough segment to uh, to get through, man. Just thinking about all the times that we had in, in Detroit and, and how special it was and how amazing you guys were. But like I told you, I felt like I owed it to my uh, my Detroit subscribers to have a little reflect about our time in, in Detroit. Like I said, so many people have been chiming in about how great you were and how you know, much they miss you and, and all those good things. Obviously, we know 
that you are a great coach and, and we really do appreciate that. So now we're going to move on to another segment. Okay. I got, just want to get your thoughts on, um, a couple of things, but first of all, I do have one fan question. Okay. I said, I was going to do one fan question for this show. And this is the fan question. She asks great fan questions. The whole, everybody been wanting to know. Here is the question from once again, Kim McQuaid. I love coach Caldwell, my favorite lines coach of all times. If you're taking questions, please ask him why he wore two watches. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'll let the cat out of the bag, um, uh, which I, I, I haven't told. Um, I don't think uh, the only, only people that, uh, that know this is, is actually my, my family for the most part. So, so here's, here's the situation. Um, I had a watch that I wore all the time because of the fact that it gave me all the information that I needed in terms of, of coaching on the field. I mean, it had um, it could the barometer to tell when it was going to start raining. Um, it, it just had all kinds of little bells and whistles that I wore on the practice field and I always wore for games. And I've done that for years and years and years. Uh, and uh, so I, I kept that. Mrs. Ford uh, had a watch that was made um, for um, certain individuals and one she may have made for me. I think um, William Clayford had a similar watch. And um, and so on game day, I always wore that, that watch in honor of her uh, and what it meant to her. So that's the reason why I wore two watches. Great job, coach. The world's been wanting to know why you wore two <laughs> watches. And that is the answer. A great honorable honorable thing um that's cool that's cool okay so now i want to talk um you know we almost we're almost out of time and i got i got some more questions i got to get in so i got to ask these questions today's you know today world we, we've, we've went through all those things and and now you, you know you're not coaching um i want to get your thoughts on some things going on in in today all right what what, what are your thoughts on the rooney rule you know, and, and like the new thing they try to do with incentivize and draft picks and uh, like, what are your what are your thoughts on that? Um, the original Rooney rule, I, I think, was was certainly needed. And, and I think it certainly served its purpose early on because it started to get uh, a lot of guys like myself in the rotation in terms of interviews to get an opportunity. Mike Tomlin, get an opportunity to get in front of owners and, and then be able to show what you can do. Um, and, and I think at some point in time that it, it worked early on, and I think you could see a change in terms of the numbers within the league. And then people started to try to skirt that rule um, by having token interviews and things of that nature, but yet knowing hey, they were not going to hire that guy or any minority. Right. It was focused in on, on another individual. And then I thought it began to lose its luster and everybody sort of felt that way as well. Um, I want to commend, you know, first of all, the incentives package that they were trying to put together. There's not anybody that I know of, um, there are, you know, African-American coaches that were involved that wanted that because of the fact that if they had done it that way, where they incentivize that position, if uh, uh, Glover Quinn got a job uh, coaching the, um, you know, Las Vegas Raiders, uh, for example, and, and you happen to get those incentives and draft picks, et cetera, and then you won. The only thing the media would talk about is, hey, they would not have won had he not gotten those incentives. You know, can this guy really coach? It would right. detract away from your ability, right? Uh, so th th nobody wanted to be involved with that kind of thing. Um, but yet we do think more opportunities in terms of interviews are, are warranted. I think those are good. Um, but the incentivizing it, uh, I just think that's bad business. But I also, like I said, I want to commend uh, Commissioner Goodell and Troy Vincent. They work extremely hard on trying to make certain that there's some changes there. They're not happy the way things are at this point in time. And they're trying to do everything they can to, to make some adjustments. But it's not them. OK, it's the owners. They can't force the owners uh, to, to hire uh, African-Americans or minorities. Uh, you know, it's up to the owners to, to have an opportunity to get enlightened, uh, to get around some of these African-American men, those guys that are coordinating for them or coaching their secondaries or coaching their running backs or whatever it might be. Get to know them, uh, get a sense of who's out there and who's available and then, uh, you know, make, make a real earnest effort to put them in the mix and give them a chance to interview like anyone else. Man, that's that's great. That's great. And I, I think. That's, that's well said and definitely needs to be put out there because you can see that it's the owners and 
I mean, from from what I have seen, I don't know if we have any uh, African American owners. Um, so that obviously would go into that. You know, far as head coaches, executives, you know, it's tough. And um, you guys are you guys are much needed. You know, half of the I would say majority of the population in the NFL are is African American, and so um, being able to relate to your coach and, and just have people where you feel like it's it's equal, the diversity is there. We got black people, we got white people, and we're all working together. So I definitely feel like the NFL, the owners, we got to do more because I do feel like there's some talented black coaches, black players that really, really, really can have a major impact. And there's some white coaches and white players that really can have a major impact as well. That's the beauty of our game is how well that we all come together and we work together. Okay. So we got another thing going on with the NFL right now. And I'm sure you keep up with this stuff, but you got players opting out, right? You got the COVID and you got players opting out. How would you handle it as a head coach, right? You're a head coach and now you got some of your best players, say, say your best players. It's opting out. And you know, especially like say you're on a hot seat um, or anything like that. And, you know, for the sake of it, say it's Matthew Stafford. You got four beautiful girls at home, baby girls. And what if he's just like, hey, man, I don't want to risk it. I, I, I want to opt out, you know. And, and the second part to that would be, do you feel like players with higher statuses, like the Patrick Mahomes, the Tom, do you feel like those guys will feel more of an obligation to play because of who they are? Hmm. Um, that, that, that's an interesting, that last question. The, the first question, um, I would tell you that I'm more interested in the health and welfare of those men that are out there on that field and their families. OK, number one. Um, and, and I think um, if our best player decided to opt out, if Matthew decided to opt out, so be it. Uh, I think that's the best thing for his family. Uh, it's the most important thing to, to him uh, in terms of him making certain they're safe and safe and healthy. And if he thought that was going to be compromised, uh, I, I think he should do just that. Um, I would not feel um, slighted, upset uh, about it at all. And as a matter of fact, I think that yeah, some of the coaches that that, that are in the, the league right now probably are looking over their shoulder a little bit as well. A lot of them are older men. Um, a lot of them have a lot of the health risks that that are associated with some of the, the more severe right. cases uh, of COVID. Um, so, you know, I'm sure some of those guys are, are, are kind of, you know, weighing, weighing their options a, a, as well. Um, and uh, but but I, I really do think that, you know, it, even the guys that are the, the big money guys, the guys get paid a lot of money. Um, I, I think you find that the, even in basketball, there were some of those guys that say, you know what? Hey, I'm not playing this year. Uh, you know, I, I, this is too much of a risk for me. I'll, I'll, let's, let's forego this until next year when things are a little bit safer and, and I'll be back. Um, and and I, I do think that perhaps um, there may be one or two of them that feel obligated. Maybe they just got a new contract or whatever it may be. It could be. I'm not certain you have to ask them that question, um, but that's a possibility. I mean, certain there is a possibility. Man, that's 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 some interesting stuff. And you know, I've been thinking about that stuff a lot because, you know, I, I you know, you, I think some players are feeling the obligation that I feel like I have to play because, you know, if, if the head guy, if the, the, the starting quarterback opts out and teams know now, hey, it's going to be tough for us to make it to the Super Bowl. Heck, man, I might as well opt out, too. I, hey, man, I might as well not risk it as well because this. So I think that's going to be interesting. I think the deadline was today. I, I think uh, we'll see a lot of guys, you know, who the whole list of things. But that, that that's an interesting thing to me. I, I really wanted to get your take on that. But since we've been going through the, the coaching stuff real quick and – I'm running out of time. I actually ran out of time, but I still got I still got some good questions for you because <laughs> I want to get to the 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 you of you. But in real quick, real quick, in say 30 seconds, what would knowing what you know, what would this guy tell this guy? <laughs> Oh, gee, I tell you, yeah, Glover, I've always been a very introspective person. Um, I've always kind of thought uh, about my future. Um, I've always weighed and gauged things. Uh, there were some things that occurred that, that, that perhaps I, I didn't see, but I'm also a, a man of faith as well. You know, um, I, I think your, your listeners might find this to be interesting. I never applied for any job. I've never wrote, typed up a resume. 
uh, because I've always believed, I said I'm a man of faith, that, that God will, will, will guide me to wherever he wants me to go. Uh, and, and that's really been the case. It's been through word of mouth. It's been through different situations like that, that I've had these, uh, these opportunities. So um, there's not a whole lot I would rethink other than the fact that I, I, I worked so hard at my craft early on, particularly in college, that I wasn't at home very much. You know, I, my wife, Cheryl, raised our kids. We have four kids. And, you know, I was in the office, the great majority of time, or on the road recruiting. College was a lot harder than professional football. They were grown by the time I got in professional football. But, but nevertheless, um, if there was one thing that I would tell that, 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 that younger guy back there in those Wake Forest days was to, uh, to slow down, uh, make a little bit more time for your family, and uh, don't be so uh, um, uh, you know, rigid in terms of your work schedule, et cetera. That, that's a good one. And I will say I did enjoy the family atmosphere that you had in Detroit Saturday mornings. My kids used to love to come in town. They get to come to practice, kind of watch the players to be up. That that right there was a cool vibe. We loved it. We enjoyed it. Let's give a round of applause for Coach Caldwell's coaching segment. I got one segment left for you, Coach. And it's just it's just a quick question. But I do want to give you a round of applause for your coaching segment. Okay, we, we come we're coming to the end. I got five questions, okay? I got five questions that I, I I think you'd be good to answer these questions. Every day and we had team meetings, you had a quote for us. Quotes that I, I still live by to this day. I still tell my kids, you know, I, I used to I tell my kids all the time. And this was probably one of my favorite quotes that you presented to us was any fool can learn from his own mistakes, right? It takes a wise man to learn from the mistakes of others, right? That was an epic quote that, you know, you presented to us. I'm sure somebody else, I don't know, but I loved it. And I still use it to this day, right? You talked, you read tons of books. So my question would be, what book belongs on everyone's bookshelf? And we're not talking about the Bible because we all know the Bible is, you know, it's a great book. But outside of the Bible, what book belongs on everybody's bookshelf? Well, one I'll tell you, because there's a bunch, but I, there's one that I, I would say to you is one called Extreme Ownership. Uh, and it's by this guy who was a long time. He was actually one of the first Navy SEALs. And, uh, and he talks about accountability and responsibility of you doing your job. Uh, and then also what it looks like in terms of you leading men. Uh, he had this quote in there. He says, there's no such thing as a bad team. He said, it's only bad coaches, right? Uh, or bad, bad lieutenants or sergeants or whomever. Because of the fact that you're not demanding enough, you don't set the standards high enough, it's why you're not improving, but then you have to take responsibility for all that. I, I think oftentimes you find so many people in today's world, they point fingers. People that are responsible, and you can see what's going on in our government today. There's so many people that don't want to take responsibility for what's going on, and they always want to blame someone else. Uh, so I think that that book would be, um, you know, uh, probably number one. Number two would be Jim Collins. I think you know, most of you guys that have sat in my meeting room know that he's one of the, my favorite authors, uh, and the book is called Great by Choice. And, uh, and, and in that book, what he does is he kind of takes comparisons of companies that, that were fly-by-night, they would pop up, they did well for a while, then they would crash and burn. And then those other companies that were steadfast, that did things the right way and last for a long, long period of time. And so he looked at all the objectives in terms of each of those particular companies and then he'd weigh them out, he'd measure them, and then he'd also make comparisons. Uh, but what the great by choice, the reason why that one it sticks out at me is because of the fact that he talks about um, being great, uh, it just doesn't happen by accident. It's a conscious choice and effort and discipline that's required. So, uh, you know, that that's what I think football is all about. If you're going to be a really good football team, if you're going to be great, it's a conscious effort. I mean, you have to come together and say, you know what? Hey, we're not going to stand for mediocre play. Uh, we're not going to stand for for mediocre responsibility of each and every individual in this particular area, room, position, whatever it might be. We want to be great. Right. So how do we get there? Uh, and then put together the plan to to to, to get it get it done. So th those would be the two books I would say right off the top of my head. All right, guys. So I've I've actually heard of those books. I've read Extreme Ownership. I think I have Great by Choice. I haven't read it yet, but I've heard a bunch of quotes throughout the years. Two great books from what, like I said, I know Extreme Ownership. We read that one, and Great by Choice. 
That is true. You got to choose to be great. Okay. Question number two. What is the best piece of advice you've been given? Hmm. Probably the, the best piece of advice I've been given is to be yourself. Um, when I took over the head job at Indianapolis, I know a reporter asked me, he says, how, you know, how are you going to feel Tony's shoes? And, and I said, you know what, I'm pretty comfortable in these size 11s that I've been wearing for, for a number of years, um, that, that I understand the importance of authenticity, and particularly in the sport of football. Um, if you go in and you're trying to be someone else, that as soon as things go wrong, as soon as there's an issue, which, you know, because of the fact football is such an emotional game, uh, that their players are going to see exactly who you are. If you are pretending to be someone else, it's going to come out. Uh, and if you're pretending to be someone else and then they see another person here, uh, you're going to immediately lose credibility. Right. Yep. So yep. authenticity, being yourself, I think is the most important thing. And that's probably the best advice that I've received. Great, great answer. Hey, man. He's dropping gems, guys. Pick up on the gems. Okay, question three. When you think of success, who comes to mind and why? Hmm. Well, when I, when I think of success, um, you know, I, I, it probably would be something a lot different than, than most people. But I, I look at my, my parents, um, 86, going to be 87 years old, never compromised their faith. Um, have everything they needed, provided everything for their family, uh, raised three strong, spiritually minded kids, uh, and and they're still living today, you know, and living vibrantly, right? Um, and and so you know, those are the most successful people that I know uh, in terms of you know how I, I I measure success. Oftentimes, people look at money. Uh, you know, you, you can't attach a U-Haul to the back of a hearse, right? Right. Uh, right. You know, so you, you can't take that with you. Uh, and, and then also when you look at how you impacted people, my parents impacted people, I'm telling you, throughout our entire community. And even so today, uh, they, they are still impacting people. So, um, you know, that, that, that to me would be um, certainly a definition of success. Good answer, man. These are good. Question four. What do you consider your greatest achievement? Well, um, I, I, I would say one is um, I I'd probably judge it the same way that I was talking about in terms of my parents. I, you know, I'd look at my four kids. Um, I got I got four great kids, great people um, that, uh, are, are model citizens that, that, uh, you know, don't get into trouble. Uh, they are who they are. They're authentic, uh, and, and, and they're quality individuals. And I think anybody that's come into contact with them would, would tell you the exact same thing. Does not mean that they've developed into the wealthiest individuals in the world? Um, but they're, they're sound in, in terms of their morals, uh, and the way in which they treat people. Uh, so I think my wife and I would probably tell you that that's probably our, our, our greatest achievement of raising, you know, four strong, independent minded individuals man that, that says a lot about you man you've you've done great things first african-american won super bowls done all those great things and for you to say your greatest achievement has to do with your family your kids that is very commendable very respectable and i think a lot of people should just start to value and, and and look at those things as great achievements and not so much of what the world feels money all that good stuff so Glad, glad, glad you said that. Okay. Last question. Question five. If you, the great coach Jim Caldwell, could send a message to the entire world, what would you say? Ooh, you have some deep questions, man. <laughs> um, so... But but that that that's a a pretty easy one for me to answer, um, and I'm not trying to proselytize. Um, you know, I think there are people that are all different types of faith throughout the the country, out throughout the world. Um, but I would say, uh, get deep into your faith, uh, study it, know it, understand it, and live it. 
uh, most importantly, live it. Uh, oftentimes you find people that say, hey, well, you know, I'm a Christian or, or you know, uh, I'm a Muslim or, or I'm, I'm, you know, I'm Jewish, whatever that might be. Uh, but, but nevertheless, you know, it, it's, it's how involved you are with your, the spiritual side. And I think that's extremely important. So, so my, my, what I would say to the world is uh, live that out. You know, uh, I, I used to always say to you guys that, uh, you know, uh, lead by example, when all else fails, use words. Uh, yep. and, and I would certainly say that to the world. Lead by example. When all else fails, use words. That's deep, guys. That is deep. Lead by example. And when all else fails, use words. Coach Caldwell, man, it's been a pleasure, man. I, I, I can't thank you enough. You know, I'm going to put this up real quick. We, we talked about um, this before the show. Um, but Coach Caldwell is, 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 is giving his knowledge to tons of people. You can have access to it. Tell us real quick about what you have going on at your website. He started an Instagram page. I didn't find that out till just now. So if you can tell us your Instagram handle so we can follow you and tell us a little bit about what you're doing on your website. Yeah. Um, yeah. The website. Let's talk about that because the Instagram kind of uh, connects to that. I can't think of my Instagram handle right now. My daughter, my daughter kind of handles that for me. So that's to be honest. Right. But but nevertheless, I, I, the, the website is Coach Jim Caldwell dot com. And what it is, um, it's given me a chance to kind of write about uh, things that uh, that I think will have an impact on young people. Particularly, I started out with a group of coaches. Uh, there's a number of different groups that I've had an opportunity to talk to via Zoom uh, across the country. A lot of young coaches, a lot of coaches that are interested in, uh, uh, you know, in improving in the profession. Uh, so a lot of those stories are personal stories that I've placed on there. But I think that you'll find that anything dealing with leadership is, is um, uh, certainly transcendent. And, and I think that regardless if you're in business, uh, you know, no matter if you're working for the sanitation department or or you're working in some you know large corporation, whatever it might be, I think those things will all be relatable to you. So so that's what it's all about. We're putting a few things in there because you know we're trying to tease possibly doing something a little bit more. So we're trying to get some reactions from people to see if some of those uh, writings are favorable. So so take a look at them if you like them. Let's like them. And, uh, and I, you know, at some other point in time, I'll find out what my Instagram handle is. And I'll get it to you. <laughs> Man, guys, go take a look at it. www.coachjimcaldwell.com. And if you can find his Instagram handle, put it out there so we can all Oh man! So we can all. I'm sure. My, I'm sure my. I'm sure my daughter's listening. She'll probably. She's probably. Like, oh, dad! You know, one of those kind of deals, and <laughs> and you know, she'll she'll have it out there before too long. But nevertheless, uh, we'll it is what it is, right? We'll definitely <laughs> get it. We'll put it out. People go and follow Coach Jim Caldwell. Coach, man, I can't thank you enough. I think you've been amazing. You've put so many good things out here for for people that you know. I've had questions about how to get into coaching and this and all that good stuff, man. You, I feel like you've kind of laid a blueprint down for a lot of people, for a lot of different things. Um, I felt like we needed to hear from you tonight and I felt like you, you delivered as like I knew you would because you are Jim Caldwell. So I'm going to give you another round of applause. Uh, uh, let me give you another <laughs> round of applause. Thank you, Coach Caldwell, and my Detroit people. They have been flooding. They have been flooding the comments all night. So much respect, so much love, so much appreciation. So thank you, Coach Caldwell, for stopping through in the DB room. It's been a real pleasure. Uh, matter of fact, since I was an old DB, I really felt at home. I'm glad. I'm glad. You're welcome here anytime. The door is always open. If you want to talk about anything, football, life, whatever, you're welcome here anytime. I will always make room for Coach Caldwell. So a lot of a lot of players reached out and wanted to say thank you, coaches. I talked to Allen. Uh, he wanted to say, tell Coach, I said hello. So you've uh, definitely made your mark on a lot of men. They all want to say thank you, and they appreciate all your hard work. Thanks a lot. Much appreciated. All right, coach. Thank you. Oh, man. Guys, 
guys, guys, wow. What do you guys think of that? Please, I know the show went kind of long tonight, but I just couldn't, I couldn't stop. I, I couldn't, I couldn't stop it. You know, he was, he was dropping too much good information. I hope you guys enjoyed that. Man, I hope you guys enjoyed that. Share it with friends. Share it with family. Hey, cuz. Oh. Yeah. It was awesome, man. It's awesome. Like, I'm at a, I'm at a loss for words. Because it was awesome. Hey. Hit me up in the comments. I'm going to try to check them. Try to get back to most of you guys. Tune in. Follow the Instagram for the next guest. You guys are amazing.